Hey, it's Michael. What you're about to listen to is chapter six of an eight part series. If you're the kind of person that likes to hear the story from the beginning, I recommend starting at chapter one. And if you're a fan of the show and want to see more, you can follow us for bonus content, images, and videos of the events and people that take place in the story by following us at How to Start a War Pod on Instagram. Now, on with the story. It's nine o'clock, and the 22-year-old Esther Greenspan wasn't expecting any guests tonight. Her parents were sitting in the kitchen, going over bills for the family business, a small tailor shop that Esther's father, a Polish immigrant now living in Germany, had built up over the last decade into a staple of the neighborhood. The first thing Esther thought about when she heard the banging on the door was her younger brother, Herschel. The 17-year-old Herschel had been living in Paris for the last two years with his uncle after several attempts to find work in Germany had failed. Herschel's Jewish background had forbade him from being hired in most places in Germany after the Nuremberg Laws. Herschel and Esther's parents thought it would be best for the young Herschel to find work in France, where they had family and where it might be safer. But France had started to become overwhelmed by Jewish refugees fleeing Germany, and the young Herschel was unable to secure a work visa. And so the 17-year-old Herschel had stayed in France beyond his date of expulsion as an illegal immigrant. The second thing Esther thought about as she heard the knocking on the door was wondering if this had anything to do with their Polish background. See, a few weeks ago, also in response to the many Jewish refugees fleeing Germany, the Polish government announced that it would abruptly revoke passports of all Polish citizens who had been living in Germany for the last five years. They would no longer be Polish citizens and would not be admitted back into their country of origin. It would effectively strand the thousands of Polish-German Jews to the confines of Germany. It was an outcome that the Nazis would not allow. Esther's father opened the door and an SS officer walked into the apartment, shouting instructions to all of the members of the household. They were to report to police headquarters immediately with their passports. When Esther's father asked what all of this was about, he was given no answers. The black-coated officer simply handed him a memorandum with the instructions on where to report and walked out, slamming the door behind him. The Greenspans arrived at the police station with what seemed like thousands of other people. They were confused, asking each other questions, sharing what they knew. All of the families who had reported to the police station seemed to have two things in common. They were all immigrants from Poland, and they were all Jews. The crowd was ordered to line up by family and then each one was handed a notice of deportation. They were being expelled from Germany. One member of each family was permitted to return to their home to pack a single suitcase, after which all of them would be required to board a train to Poland. Tonight. Over the course of the next few hours, more than 12,000 Polish-German Jews were packed into rail cars bound for Poland. Frightened and taken from their homes, the trains approached the Polish border. 
Esther and her family were outraged and scared. Esther's father had been in Germany for more than 25 years. He owned a business here, a storefront. He was a contributor to the community. And Esther hadn't even been born in Poland. She was born in Germany. The Greenspans was frantically trying to get answers from others in the train car, but no one seemed to have any. Then, as the train was approaching the Polish border, it began to slow down. Then, it stopped. Esther and her parents tried to look out the window to see what was happening. All they could see were bright lights pointed at the train and shouts from men speaking German and Polish at each other, shouting back and forth. As we've said, the Polish government had effectively banned Jews who had left Poland for Germany from re-entering the country. The Nazis, not wanting to keep those Jews in Germany either, banned them from Germany too, and immediately deported them back to Poland. The Polish government had not expected this quick action from Germany, and now that their plan had backfired and trains full of Polish Jews were now headed towards them, Poland decided to slam the door shut completely. Poland closed its borders, forbidding the entry of the Jews who had just been expelled from Germany, the thousands of men, women, and children on those trains from entering their country of origin. Cold, frightened, and stateless, Esther and her family, along with the thousands of other refugees, were now trapped between the borders of Germany and Poland, not allowed in either country. An internment camp began to be built, and Esther finally had an opportunity to write to her brother, the 17-year-old Herschel, in France, and desperately plead to him for anything he could send them. The events of this night and Esther's letter to her young brother would set off a chain of events that would later become known as Kristallnacht, or the Night of Broken Glass. Others came to know it as its less formal title, the beginning of the Holocaust. I'm Michael Trapani, and this is How to Start a War, a story from the past that can help us understand our world today. While the characters we follow are at the center of this story, they are not the heroes. This is not that kind of story. This story is about what happens when good people do nothing to stop the worst people on Earth while they still can. Let's continue. Chapter 6, Broken Glass. A warning. This is the darkest chapter of this story. Because of the events that take place in the chapter that are about to unfold, it may be difficult to listen to. But the events did actually happen. And because they actually happened, the lessons that come out of this chapter must be listened to. When Esther's postcard to her brother Herschel arrived in Paris, he read it quickly. For the last week, the 17-year-old Herschel had been frantically scanning the Paris newspapers for word on the situation at the Polish border with Germany. He knew that his family lived in the city where the arrests had taken place and was desperate to know what had happened to them. For days, he had been writing letters and waiting for word, wondering what had happened to his family, if they were among the deported if they were among the stranded. Herschel's eyes darted across the handwriting of the postcard, and he saw that it belonged to his sister. 
Herschel's fears were realized. Esther had written of their arrest, their deportation, and that they and thousands of other Jews were now stranded at the German border with Poland, freezing in the November cold, that a makeshift camp was being built to contain them as refugees, homeless, stateless, penniless. Esther's letter read as a desperate plea for help, but her tone also seemed to acknowledge that there may be no hope and that it might be too late. Like a letter saying goodbye. Herschel finished reading and pressed his eyes shut. He clenched the postcard in his fist so hard that they began to shake. He became dizzy, then enraged. He put on his overcoat and left his uncle's apartment, hearing nothing but his white-hot thoughts, seeing nothing but the sidewalk and his feet, moving him automatically to where he needed to go. He turned into a small shop and walked up to the counter. The shop clerk eyed him suspiciously. Herschel pointed at what he wanted to buy. The clerk asked him why he needed it. Herschel said that he worked for his father's business and moved large sums of cash. It was enough. He left the shop and headed west towards a cafe. He walked into the cafe and went into the restroom and closed the door. He opened the bag of what he had just bought and stared at it. He got onto the metro and took it to the German embassy, where he arrived at 9.30 in the morning. As Herschel walked into the embassy, he told the receptionist that he had an urgent document that he needed to hand deliver to the German ambassador, and he needed to see him immediately. He was directed upstairs to the ambassador's office, where he told the same information to a secretary. The secretary said the ambassador was not available, but offered to deliver the document for Herschel but Herschel insisted that it was his orders to hand the document directly to an embassy official. The secretary told Herschel that he would have to wait. He waited. Finally, he was called into the office of a young junior German official, Ernst von Rath. Herschel was escorted to the official von Rath's office, who was waiting at his door with a pleasant smile on his face. The German official said, hello, and invited Herschel in. The 17-year-old Herschel moved methodically into the office and sat down in the chair, facing von Rath's desk. He said nothing. The official closed his office door and sat down at his desk. Now they were alone. Von Rath spoke first. Well now, what's all this about? Herschel's eyes were pointed at von Rath, but they weren't looking at anything. The German official tried again. I'm told this matter is urgent. Herschel's jaw muscles were tightening. Von Rath finally asked, impatiently, <clears throat> Where is this document? Herschel's eyes snapped into focus. His neck straightened. He knew exactly where he was. He suddenly jumped out of his chair, looking down at Von Rath, and shouted, You are a filthy kraut! And in the name of 12,000 persecuted Jews, here is your document! Herschel didn't run. He sat back in his chair, waiting in the office for the authorities to arrive. When the police got there, he voluntarily surrendered. He was taken to jail. Von Rath was rushed to the hospital, where he died two days later, on November 9th, 1938. The German official was killed, but the real crime was still to be committed.
The 9th of November was a national holiday in Germany. It was the anniversary of the event in which we began our story. The fateful attempt by Hitler to overthrow the German government in 1923. It was the anniversary of the Beer Hall Putsch. In Munich, it was customary for the senior-most Nazi officials to gather and celebrate the anniversary. Hitler and his minister of propaganda, Josef Goebbels, were attending the official party dinner when a telegram of the news of von Rath's death was handed to them. Hitler was furious. The Fuhrer was scheduled to make a speech that night, but after receiving the news, Goebbels proposed that he could make it instead. He said that he could use this moment as a catalyst for him to enact Hitler's broader ambitions against the Jewish people. He said, Let them pay for this death tonight, in the streets. Unleash the S.A. Unleash the S.S. Hitler agreed and left to allow Goebbels to give the orders in his speech to the room of officials. When Goebbels got up, he made the announcement. Gentlemen, Ernst von Rath is dead. The senior officials in the room were shocked and outraged. Goebbels proceeded. The blame for this senseless murder is not on this boy Greenspan, but on a global Jewish conspiracy that needs to be put down once and for all. The men in this room must act tonight to respond to this barbarism towards their Aryan brother. Goebbels put one of the men in the room in charge, Reynard Heydrich, the number two man in the SS secret police, a man so fierce that Hitler himself named him Ironheart. After speaking with Goebbels, he issued coordinated orders to the Gestapo, the SA, the SS, local governments, local police, even the fire departments. He issued the following telegram to every locality across the Third Reich. Most urgent telegram from Munich of November 10th, 1938, 1.20 a.m. To all headquarters and stations of the state police, urgent for immediate attention of the chief. Subject, measures against the Jews tonight. Demonstrations against the Jews are to be expected in all parts of the Reich in the course of the coming night, November 9, 10, 1938. The instructions below are to be applied in dealing with these events. The chiefs of the state police must immediately contact the political leaders in their areas and arrange a joint meeting to discuss the demonstrations. Only such measures are to be taken that do not endanger German lives or property, i.e. synagogues are to be burned down only where there is no danger of fire in neighboring buildings. Places of business and apartments belonging to Jews may be destroyed, but not looted. In business districts, particular care is to be taken that non-Jewish businesses are completely protected against damage. Foreign citizens, even if they are Jews, are not to be molested. Assuming that the guidelines above are observed, the demonstrations are not to be prevented by the police, which is only to supervise the observance of the guidelines. As many Jews, especially the rich, as can be accommodated in the existing prisons, are to be arrested. For the time being, only healthy male Jews, which are not too old, are to be detained. The appropriate concentration camps are to be contacted immediately for prompt accommodations of the Jews in the camps. It was a night of unimaginable horror throughout Germany. Rather than telling you alone, you'll hear what happened from survivors of that night.
that was at night when it began, way at night, after 11 or 12. We were already in bed, and we heard all of a sudden loud clattering in the street, and we, we heard that it was glass, shattering of glass, and uh, voices that were screaming, people were screaming, but we didn't dare to look out of the window. We were afraid. In the street were SA troopers, SS officers, and policemen, most of them dressed in plain clothes to appear to be average citizens. They were marching, shouting. Then they started to get violent going from house to house, building to building, business to business, under torchlight. Uh, we were woken up about midnight by a loud banging on the door, and about eight, seven or eight uh, people in SR uniform uh, shouted Hausuchung, which is official, the, the, the term is search action, and it implied that this is a legal search action. We had no idea what it was all about. And in the middle of the night, they came pounding on the front door. I remember that. And the fear that this instills in a child is a, f a feeling of fear that never in your life can you forget. Homes of Jewish families were entered with official government search warrants. They were then ripped apart, ransacked, turned inside out. They knocked down the door with an ax, they threw bricks into the windows, and then they came in. They destroyed everything that they could see. They went into the kitchen, they knocked down the flour and the sugar, the cheese that my grandmother had made, and then made a mess on the kitchen floor. And then one of them urinated on top of all of this garbage and then took his hand and spread it all over the kitchen. Everything was demolished, broken. With the, with the axes. There was no window left. They took all the linens, they threw them out of the window, and all of the people in the town were downstairs outside collecting all of the things that were thrown out the window and taking them home. There wasn't a chair left in the house, there wasn't a mattress, the mattresses they threw out the window, there wasn't a bed left in the house, and there wasn't a window that wasn't broken. After the stormtroopers left the apartments, those same Jewish families began to receive phone calls. Phone calls that made it clear that this was not an isolated incident. We got phone calls from friends and said, Lily, have you heard? My mother, Lily, have you heard what's going on? They're, they're throwing people out of the windows. They actually did. They're burning the synagogues. And I said, no, we don't know anything. We, we have been home. and um, so." The phone call kept coming. We got more and more worried. And uh, I remember one friend, a uh, Christian friend, calling up and saying, Lily, under no circumstances must you open the, uh, the door. Whoever knocks, rings, or whatever, do not open the door. And so I looked through this little window uh, of the attic, and I saw the rabbi standing on his veranda, and there were two I guess they were SS men, they were holding him by the arm, and another one came along with some kind of a scissor or implement, I don't remember, and he held it and cut off his beard. Across the country, Jewish places of worship began to be set on fire. Not in street riots, as it was made to look, but in coordinated, measured arson. From Cologne to Berlin, Frankfurt, there were fires. Synagogues were transformed into infernos. 
Fire trucks would arrive on the scene, prepared to put out the fire, and yet every single one of them seemed unable to contain the blaze. There were mass arrests of Jews. If resistance was met, it was broken with beatings and even death. Suddenly, uh, a lot of cars came from outside. There were no, nobody owned cars in my village. So uh, cars came up and people came out who arrested uh, all the Jewish men, including my brother. My brother was then 17. Well, my uncle was killed in front of my cousin. They lived in a big house and he was actually thrown down the stairs. We didn't know it at the time and uh, they stamped with their boots, stamped him to death in front of my cousin. And we formed lines and then we started to walk. They said, walk. It was a very small street and uh, outside, they told all the, all the other people, stay outside at the side and watch it. It's a spectacle. And we walked him finally and they spit at us, they called names like animals. They came from building to building, from apartment to apartment, knocking on the doors and pulling out the men. You couldn't object. If you did, they beat you. They um, came for my father. Uh, being as I was attached to my father, I held his arm and I stood up against my mother's <laughs> uh, upbringing. I said, no, you cannot take my father. And I said, why would you take my father? Why? And I said, you will not take him. I won't let him go. He didn't do anything. At that point, he grabbed me and threw me against the wall, and I didn't remember anything. I blacked out. As day broke, the extent of the destruction by the hands of the German government began to become even more clear and even more horrifying. I walked out in the morning and my shoes were thick soled and the glass went through the soles. They destroyed every Jewish business, every Jewish windows, every Jewish establishment. For miles, the glass was sort of glittering in the snow. It was terrible. It was the worst sight I've ever, I, I can never remember. When he, he saw a big fire coming that we could see from a long distance and he thought that it might be our house, it wasn't, uh, but it was uh, the synagogue. More than 30,000 Jews had been arrested under the guise of protective custody and hauled away to concentration camps. Nearly 100 Jews were murdered on the spot. Over 250 synagogues were burned to the ground. More than 7,000 Jewish-owned businesses were destroyed. Consistently reported in every incident were the broken windows of the shops, factories, and homes, which now glistened in the streets and sidewalks across the country like crystal. Crystal Nacht, the Night of Broken Glass, or the November Pogrom, as it later became known, was a turning point in the Nazi regime. For years, violence and discrimination against Jews 
was encouraged by the party, even solidified into law. But that night, in November 1938, was the first time coordinated violence against the Jews was ordered and carried out by the federal government. Through the lens of history, Kristallnacht is a thoroughly planned, calculated attack, with all angles considered. After all, Hitler sat on top of an authoritarian regime and could do whatever he wanted. But a meeting that took place a few days later, a meeting that brought together Hitler's top henchmen, shows just how little the repercussions of this attack were actually thought through. This meeting might be the most difficult account you will hear during this series. Much like Goring's phone calls to Austria in Chapter 4, an actual transcript of this meeting exists. What everyone said in the room, what they discussed, was transcribed. The dialogue you are about to hear was actually spoken by the men in this room. It has been translated from its original German word for word. I want to warn you that the conversation you're about to listen to, not only the topic, but the tone in which the Nazi officials speak, is about as horrifying as you could possibly imagine. The rotund Hermann Göring was not only Hitler's second-in-command, but he was also responsible for the German economy. Two days after Kristallnacht, he called a large meeting, together with Goebbels, Heydrich, and dozens of other officials, to have not only a post-mortem on Kristallnacht, but to develop a plan to finish the job, to coordinate the removal of the Jewish people from all remaining aspects of the German economy. Gentlemen, Goring called the meeting to order. Today's meeting is of a decisive nature. The Jewish question must now, and once and for all, be coordinated and solved one way or another. They began with the first topic a debrief on Kristallnacht. As it turned out, there was collateral damage being discovered that these leaders of the Reich had not considered, one that was becoming a very big problem for the German economy. Of course, you're probably thinking, all of the deaths of those Jewish people and those who were rounded up, right? International backlash from global press, right? Wrong. The decisive issue that was burdening the German economy was not the action against the Jews, but all of the broken glass that was caused by the smashing of the windows during the program. Yes, really, the windows. Goring continued, Gentlemen, I have had enough of the protests. They do not harm the Jew, but me, who is the last authority of the German economy. Consider this. Yes, many thousands of windows of Jewish-owned businesses were broken during Kristallnacht. But the vast majority of the buildings themselves, of which the windows were a part, were actually owned by Germans. Germans that were now filing insurance claims on their damaged properties by the thousands. If the building owners had been Jewish, it would have been easy for Goring to just reject the insurance claims. But Germans? Goring goes on. The pogrom has been a far-reaching economic problem. Unfortunately, it is not the Jew that suffers from this, but the German insurance companies. Let's not forget the precarious situation the global economy is still in. We are still in the Great Depression. The German economy is still very much in recovery. Yes, things were turning around in the German economy, but it was mostly being propped up by government programs and incentives that didn't have to be paid for for a long time. Rejecting the insurance claims of more than 7,000 German real estate businessmen, most of them wealthy, 
would remove all faith in the German insurance system, and the industry would go into freefall. Bring in Mr. Hilgard from the insurance company. Goring had invited a representative of the German insurance companies, a man named Eduard Hilgard, to provide an assessment for the leaders from his professional opinion. Hilgard, an accomplished executive with a long career as CEO of various insurance companies, entered the room. Mr. Hilgard, we'd like to hear from you. I want you to pay attention to the tone of Hilgard, this insurance executive in a room filled with Nazi officials. Many of us who think about Nazis think of them as usually men in military uniforms, government men, official men. But Hilgard was a civilian, a corporate suit. He didn't work for the Nazi government. He worked for the insurance corporations. But in the way he describes the problem, can you tell the difference? Hilgard began by explaining that most of the insurance claims for fire and theft were Jewish. As for the glass insurance, he continued, the situation is completely different. The majority of the victims, the owners of the buildings, are Aryan. This is a very great catastrophe for us. The amount of damage in a single night is double the size of the damage we normally get in an entire year. And if we refuse to honor these clear-cut obligations, it would be a black spot on the shield of German insurance. May I point out to you the fact that the glass that must be replaced is not even made in Germany, but in Belgium. We believe that it will take at least six months for the manufacturers to deliver all the glass that is needed. Goring turned back to the room of officers. This cannot continue. It will be impossible for this economy to last with all of this. Then he turned to face Heydrich, the man who had orchestrated the attack, and showed just how dark of a room we're in. Why couldn't you just kill 200 Jews instead of destroying so many valuables? Heydrich shot back defensively. We did kill at least 35. At the end of the discussion, it was decided that insurance claims submitted by non-Jews and foreign Jews would be honored, and the insurance industry would get a bailout to help pay for it. All claims by German Jews would be rejected. Next, they moved into the main topic of the meeting, how best to remove the Jewish people from the German economy. Goring began the discussion. I do not want to leave any doubt, gentlemen, as to the aim of today's meeting. We have not come together merely to talk again, but to make decisions. And I implore your agencies to take all measures of the elimination of the Jew from the German economy and to submit them to me. The group of Nazi officials then began to pitch and debate all of the ways in which they could accomplish this. Like a corporate board meeting, the officials around the table began to throw out ideas, some of them deeply embedded into their racist, anti-Semitic vision. Some of the ideas were just spitballs off the tops of their heads. A brainstorming session. The first idea was proposed and widely accepted, that no Jewish person should be allowed to own or operate their own business anymore, and that existing Jewish-owned businesses were to be turned over to an Aryan for his benefit. On this proposal, Goring said, Yes, yes, the state will estimate the value of the business and decide what amount the Jew shall receive for it. Naturally, this amount will be set as low as possible. Then we will turn the business over to an Aryan business owner. Next, what of all the synagogues that were just burned down during Kristallnacht? The propaganda minister Goebbels had very strong opinions on this one. 
I am of the opinion that this is our chance to dissolve the synagogues. All those that were partially destroyed will need to be demolished completely. And, and we can make the Jews themselves do it and pay for it. In their places, we will build parking lots or new buildings. But Goebbels didn't stop there. He was, after all, the Minister of Propaganda and Culture. Culture spilled into all aspects of German life, and Goebbels sought to remove Jews from these areas as well. I deem it necessary to forbid Jews from entering German theaters, movie houses, stadiums. We should have separate compartments for Jews on trains. They shall not mix with Germans. And if there is no room, then we, we will make them stand in the corridors. Goebbels, the devil's ideologue, is countered with Goering, the devil's pragmatist. I would give the Jews one car, and if the car is overcrowded, we'll kick them out and he'll have to sit all alone in the bathroom. Goebbels continued. Furthermore, there ought to be a decree barring Jews from German beaches and, and, and resorts. Well, we could just give them their own. But, but not our good ones. It should also be considered to forbid Jews to enter the German forest. In certain forests, whole herds of them are running around. It's a constant problem. We have incidents there all the time. Goring put Goebbels' horrifying ideas into a concrete plan. We shall give the Jews a certain part of the forest where various animals even look like Jews, like uh, the elk, which has a crooked nose. Uh, I'm sure they will fit in well. Goebbels kept going. And Jews should not be allowed in German parks. And, and Jewish children are still allowed in German schools. This is unacceptable. Goebbels went on in his mad proclamations, all of them taken down as meeting minutes, all carefully considered. All of them would be adopted into law. At last, the conversation moved to its final topic. It was time for the man with the iron heart to present his ideas. Heydrich spoke. Beyond the elimination of the Jew from economic life, the main problem, namely to kick the Jew out of Germany, remains. The monstrous men in this room could eliminate Jews from recreational and cultural areas, but the ultimate goal was to eliminate Jews from Germany completely. The group first discussed the idea of deporting all Jews from Germany, Remember, Germany had already revoked citizenship from German Jews. Goring deemed this a good idea, but too slow. Deportation takes time and planning, and then it becomes an international issue. This was a logistical objection from Goring, not a humanitarian one. It was at this time that the German leadership first discussed the prospect of isolating Jews as a people from all aspects of German society. And it was the first time a new concept was seriously proposed. Ghettos. Goring said, We will not be able to avoid the creation of ghettos on a very large scale in every city. It will have to be created. Heydrich wasn't so sure about the idea. He was concerned about maintaining control. We could not control a ghetto where the Jews congregate. It would remain a permanent hideout for criminals and also for epidemics and the like. What about restricting the movement of German Jews instead? Another official seemed to agree. I don't imagine the prospect of a ghetto is very nice. The goal must be to expel them instead. Still, Goring believed that it would be inevitable to build them. But Heydrich wasn't finished. What about a law like this? No Jew should be allowed to own a car or to be permitted to drive. And I propose we do the same thing to hospitals. A Jew shall not lie in a hospital together with an Aryan. Goring was working this out in his head, but didn't seem to think the idea was a bad one. We'll have to work that out gradually, 
Are there no Jewish hospitals already? We'll have to figure out all of this. Goring was starting to wrap up with the most immediate need. One more question, gentlemen. What do you think the situation would be if I announced today that the Jews would have to contribute a billion marks in punishment of their destruction over the last few days? Goebbels, always suspicious in his hatred, said, I wonder if the Jews will pull their money out of the banks, put something on the side. The others agreed, and said that if Goring made this announcement, that the government would have to withdraw the funds automatically from those banks, very quickly, within days. Goring agreed. Yes, yes, I will make that happen. Goring then closed the meeting. I shall close the meeting in this way. The German Jewish people shall, as punishment for their abominable crimes, etc., etc., shall have to make the contribution of one billion marks. That'll work. The pigs won't commit another murder. <laughs> Incidentally, I would like to say again that I would not like to be a Jew in Germany today. From this moment forward, the plight of the Jewish people in the Third Reich would reach unspeakable cruelty. The crime of the century. The men in this room, discussing the matter like they were on a conference call, would be the criminals. The Holocaust would become the deadliest genocide in modern history. More than six million innocent Jews would be killed. Millions more would be imprisoned, tortured, starved, experimented on enslaved. The logistics of such a monumental crime against humanity was first brainstormed in this room over lunch. When we return, the final chapter of Czechoslovakia. We'll be right back. Hey, it's Michael. If the story you're listening to has been meaningful to you in any way, please write us a review in Apple Podcasts. When you write a review, it helps us with our rankings and helps more people find how to start a war. Thanks again for listening. Now, back to the story. President Hacha's heart condition did not allow him to fly. Four months after Kristallnacht, and five months after Germans were allowed to invade the Sudetenland of Czechoslovakia, Hitler summoned the President of Czechoslovakia, or what was left of it, Emil Hacha, to Berlin. The Czech president was sitting in a waiting room where he had already been sitting for two hours. He was nervous because he was certain of what was about to happen. It was almost one o'clock in the morning. Within days of signing the Munich Agreement, the one that had stripped away the Sudetenland from Czechoslovakia and rendered the small country defenseless against Germany, the president of Czechoslovakia at the time, one of its founding fathers, resigned from office, deeming himself a failure to his beloved country. In his place stepped Emil Hacha, the chief justice of the Czech Supreme Court. Unlike the founding president, the new president, Hacha, was a reserved pragmatist. He cared deeply for his people and wanted to keep them safe. And he knew that the existence of Czechoslovakia was hanging by a thread after the Munich Agreement. 
and saw his task as to save what was left of the Czech states, its borderlines, its sovereignty, and its people. Little did the new Czech president know that Hitler had already been making plans to finish the job. Just like before, Hitler had been secretly bankrolling Nazi uprisings all over Czechoslovakia. To the casual observer, it seemed as if Nazism was catching fire all over the country. But it was actually targeted funding by Hitler to key Nazi sympathizing groups. The time had come to activate those cells, to cause unrest, and even attempt to break away from the unstable Czech government. Smaller parts of the country, like Slovakia, had already declared their independence from the central Czechoslovakian government and absorbed themselves into the German Reich voluntarily. Czechoslovakia was now even smaller. Only two regions of the country still remained intact, notably Bohemia, where the capital city of Prague still held strong. President Hacha, seeing Hitler chip away at his country piece by piece, reached out to Hitler directly to attempt to settle this problem in a way that would cause no further harm to the country or his people. Hitler was all too happy to accept the request and summoned the aging Czech president to Berlin. He had arrived in Berlin that afternoon, traveling by train. The elder president's heart condition did not allow him to fly. He was escorted to Berlin's most luxurious hotel, where he was served dinner. Afterwards, President Hacha arrived at the Reich Chancellery to make his appointment with Hitler. He was led to a waiting room, where he now was. He was kept waiting for two hours. Hitler was watching a movie. At last, at 1.30 a.m., Hacha was finally summoned to Hitler's office. As the president entered the Fuhrer's study, he realized immediately that he had just walked into a trap. He saw that in the room was not only Hitler and his foreign minister, the sly Ribbentrop, but also General Keitel, head of the military high command, and the rotund Hermann Göring. Hacha appeared calm as he understood the room he was in, and the audience to which he was speaking. He did what he believed would give him the best possible outcome. He began to flatter and even grovel to Hitler. He said that he knew that the fate of Czechoslovakia fell squarely into the hands of the German leader, and that he believed that those hands would keep it safe. He said that what mattered to him most were two things. First, the sovereignty of the Czech state, and second, and most important, the safety of his people. Hitler listened to President Hacha, but seemed to have no interest in what he was actually saying. Hacha finished his plea. Then, it was Hitler's turn. He launched into one of his diatribes on all of the atrocities that Czechs had supposedly performed on Germans, how unfair it was that the Czechs had even challenged Germany to begin with, and how useless the Munich Agreement was, that all matters related to this region were now up to Germany and no one else. And then Hitler dropped a bomb. And so, last Sunday, I gave the order for the invasion of Czechoslovakia by German troops and for the incorporation of it into the German Reich. You could hear a pin drop. Hitler had just said that Germany was invading Czechoslovakia, that the order had already been given last week. It was already over. 
President Hacha looked like he had just been turned into stone. Only his open eyes showed that he was even alive. Hitler wasn't finished. The German army is marching in as we speak. It has already begun. At some Czech barracks there was resistance, but it was ruthlessly broken. Tomorrow morning at 6 o'clock, the German army is to enter Czechoslovakia from all sides, and the German air force will occupy the Czech airfields. There are now two options. The first is that entry of German troops might develop into fighting. In that case, resistance will be broken by brute force. The second option is that the entry of the German troops would take place in a peaceful manner, in which case it will be easy for me to accord Czechoslovakia a generous way of life of its own, autonomy, and even a certain measure of national freedom. I'm doing all of this not from hatred, but in order to protect Germany. If last autumn Czechoslovakia had not given in, the Czech people would have been exterminated. Nobody would have stopped me. If it came to a fight, in only two days the Czech army would cease to exist. Naturally, some Germans would be killed too, and this would engender a hatred, which would compel me in self-preservation not to give you autonomy. And let me tell you, the world will not care in the least about all of this. This is why I asked you to come here. This was the last good deed I could render for the Czech people. Perhaps your visit here and now might prevent the worst. But I warn you, the hours are passing. At six o'clock this morning, my troops will march in. I am almost ashamed to say it, but for every Czech battalion, there is a German division. My best advice to you now is to take a moment and sort out what needs to be done. There was no more color left in President Hacha's face. He did not need to sort anything out. There were no options. He looked up at Hitler and finally spoke. The uh, situation is quite clear. Resistance would be folly. But how, here in Berlin, at two in the morning, am I to prevent all of the Czechoslovakian people from putting up a resistance? I suggest you get in touch with Prague to figure that out. The German military machine is already in motion and cannot be stopped. You may discuss the details in the next room. The president of Czechoslovakia was then escorted into the next room by Goring and the foreign minister Ribbentrop. If President Hacha thought Hitler was bad, his lackeys would only turn up the pressure. Ribbentrop closed the door, and Goring pointed his thick finger towards the table at the center of the room. On the table was a surrender document that Hacha was told to sign. It would turn his entire country over to Germany. Hacha began to protest to the German officials. He pleaded, saying that he could never sign a document like this, that he could not surrender his entire country. He would be forever cursed by his people. All the while, outside of the room, German military telephone operators began to attempt to create a connection to Prague so that anything agreed to in the room by Hacha could be immediately communicated by him to the Czech capital. But when the German operators tried to open the line to Prague, it didn't work. Of course it didn't work. It's 1938 at 2 a.m. No one is in the office, and no one is operating the phones. Ribbentrop was asked to come out of the room to help get the line set up, as the operators continued to frantically try to make the connection to the Czech capital. Back inside the room, Goring's requests started to become fearsome demands. He began to shout at Hacha to make a decision, pointing at the document on the table. 
As Hacha backed away, still refusing to sign, Goring began to follow him around the table, bullying him louder and louder. Goring kept taking the pen from the table and forcing it into Hacha's hand, stalking him around the table in circles like prey. Listen to me, my dear Hacha. I would hate to bomb the beautiful city of Prague in the morning, but I will do it if it will accelerate the whole matter. On and on, Goring berated the Czech president, his threats of violence growing more and more intense. At last, Hacha broke. There were no other options but to speak with Prague and to make them aware of the situation. Hacha submitted and agreed to give the order of no resistance. Now it was a race against the clock. In the hall, Ribbentrop was wildly pacing back and forth behind the telephone operators as they tried to desperately make the connection. Then the line to Prague finally opened. Ribbentrop shouted to Goring down the hall that it was ready for the Czech president to give the order. Goring picked up the telephone in the room and shoved it into Hacha's face so that he could tell the Czech military to stand down and avoid a bloodbath. Just as Hacha was about to speak, the connection was lost. Ribbentrop exploded. Get this line back immediately or you will be fired and this entire operating staff will be dismissed from their posts! Hacha helplessly held the phone receiver in his hand. His inability to order no resistance meant that thousands of his people might be killed in a matter of hours. He looked around the room. He was becoming dizzy. The room was beginning to spin. Until... Doctor! Doctor! Come in here! President Hotcha has collapsed! Goring was shouting for the Fuhrer's personal physician. The Czech president had collapsed and was now lying on the floor, unconscious. This was now a crisis. What if the president of Czechoslovakia had just died? Right here, in the Reich Chancellery in Berlin, next to Hitler's own office. It would be an international incident. The doctor rushed in and knelt beside the unconscious Czech president. He went into his bag and pulled out a needle and administered a series of injections into the Czech president to try to revive him. Hacha awoke. He was in a complete daze. After a few moments, he remembered where he was and what he had agreed to do. At that moment, the line to Prague had been opened again. The receiver was once again shoved into the president's face. Hacha feebly gave the order. The German military will occupy Czechoslovakia. No... No resistance is to be given. He then signed the surrender document, the death warrant of his country and his people. Here's what the document said. At their request, the Fuhrer today received the Czech president, Hacha, to Berlin. At that meeting, the serious situation created by the events of the recent weeks was examined with complete frankness. The Czechoslovakian president declared that, in order to achieve ultimate pacification, he confidently placed the fate of the Czech people in the hands of the Fuhrer of the German Reich. The Fuhrer accepted this declaration and expressed his intention of taking the Czech people under the protection of the German Reich. After Hacha signed, Goring breathed a sigh of relief and wiped the sweat off his forehead. He said, It has been a very strenuous day for such an old man. Hitler was ecstatic. 
when he heard that Hacha had signed, Hitler sprinted out of his office to where his secretaries were working. He ran up to them, hugged them, and shouted in a high-pitched fever, Children, this is the greatest day of my life. I shall go down in history as the greatest German. At 6 a.m., just as Hitler said, German troops crossed into Czechoslovakia. No resistance was given. In Prague, the city was covered in snow. As the people of Prague woke up, residents saw German trucks and tanks rolling down the streets, cutting treads into the freshly fallen snow. The German troops carried field guns into Prague Castle, the centerpiece of the city. Hitler would arrive later that evening, triumphantly riding through the streets of Prague. He would sleep in the castle that night, like a conquering king. Factor six in how to start a war is willful ignorance. We are about to enter the final part of our story. There are times in history when atrocities take place. There are times when there are hints to something very, very bad. Clues that, on their own, might be innocuous, but in a broader context, obvious. The conversations in the Nazi conference room following Kristallnacht, where Goring and Goebbels were casually brainstorming ways to eliminate the Jews, were not public. If these transcripts were public, there would be no denying the Nazis' ultimate intentions. There would have been international outrage, maybe even serious consequences for Hitler's regime. But here's the thing. Crimes are not committed out in the public and things were still happening. Five years earlier, your treatment as a Jew versus a non-Jew was codified into law. Nearly every synagogue in the Third Reich had just been burned to the ground. Tens of thousands of Jews were being expelled from the country on a monthly basis, and in a single night, federal agents entered 30,000 Jewish homes and hauled them into concentration camps, killing at least a hundred of them where they stood, in front of their children. Things were happening. Things that people should have been paying more attention to. Atrocities are almost never presented in their complete form to the public until it is too late. Many people with a lot of power go to great lengths to prevent their atrocities from being that easy to recognize. Willful ignorance also let Hitler complete his conquest of Czechoslovakia without an international incident. As for an explanation for the public and the international press, in the case of Kristallnacht, Goebbels provided an alternative explanation of the events that was while not plausible, physically possible. Hitler did the same with President Hotch's signature on the joint statement that he was made to sign. So the story became, Germany is not invading. The Czechs asked for German military assistance. We are not rounding up the Jews. We are putting them into protective custody to save them from these spontaneous riots. They are not federal police officers in uniforms burning down synagogues, but rioters in plain clothes. Hitler knew that the Allied democracies still did not have an appetite for war. He learned it at Munich when the British and French heads of government signed away all hope of Czechoslovakian sovereignty in exchange for peace. 
He learned it in Austria, when the same leaders dismissed the events as Hitler just annexing a neighboring German region. Hitler knew that if he provided an out, something that might not be flawless, but gave plausible deniability, the explanation would be taken to avoid a war. This chapter will be the last demonstration of willful ignorance that the Allies would show. The international response that followed the final invasion of Czechoslovakia was markedly different than it was after the Sudetenland and Austria. For the first time, the British Prime Minister Chamberlain gave a speech drawing a line in the sand, a public statement that, if violated, would cause Great Britain to go to war with Germany. From this moment forward, Hitler was set on a collision course with the rest of human civilization. A collision course towards the eyes of history and the final episodes of how to start a war. How to Start a War is written and produced by me. You can get bonus content, images, and video of the people and events in each episode by following How to Start a War Pod on Instagram. I'm Michael Trapani. Thanks for listening.